<laughs> who knew how many books we had? We, Holy uh, crap. We're live. We are live. Uh, <laughs> hey, everybody. Hey. Oh, oh here we go. <laughs> uh, welcome to Fat Man Beyond. I'm Kevin Smith. I am Mark Bernardin. Hey. Oh. Uh, we were just discussing um, the the uh, this is uh, look at me. Where am I? I'm, I'm in the Game of Thrones room in my new home. Uh, this is a room that uh, was a bedroom um, when we bought the house. But as I was just talking to Mark about my something, perhaps a lot of people don't know about my wife. She is a book nut. She is, uh, I believe the term is bibliophile. Indeed. Um, but, you know, of everything we moved, for those that don't follow that closely, the house that I've been living in for 22 years, um, we vacated and we're now in this house in Studio City. Where my neighbor, the other day I got hit up, um, Tyler Posey, mm -hmm. you know, the, the oh, team boy. of himself, yes. Um, who was in yoga hosers, the ill-fated yoga hosers. Um, he hit me up where he's like, oh my God, you live on Barry? I live on, we moved to Barry Drive in Studio City. And he's like, I'm right near you. He's like, literally, I could go borrow sugar from the motherfucker right now. The king of OnlyFans. Um, he's got a huge Only OnlyFans page. Uh, Shatner lives here. Not here, but like mm. somewhere in the neighborhood as well. So um, in moving, what I discovered was the house we were in over on La Presa, which we'd been in for like two decades, um, there were books everywhere, but the house, there was so much square footage that I never really noticed. I mean, I knew half the library was books. The other half was where I did Fat Man Beyond. That was my office. But there were bookshelves like everywhere. So most of the move was about unpacking fucking books and this this room books books um this i would say represents eight percent of the books in this house <laughs> she's she got a serious fucking collection i.e problem uh but it's never a problem when it's books for heaven's sakes so yeah, a lot of books is what I'm getting at. If, if I was ever to sit there and be like, where did all my money go? Books. The money's in the books. It is, yeah, literally. But although, sadly, not within the pages of the hollowed out books or some such. Mm. But she, at one point, she was like, I collected like five bins of books that we can donate. I'm like, donate? Fucking no. Like, <laughs> use them to build a new home or some, or sell them on eBay. But donate? As my Christian mother used to say when I was a kid, charity begins at home, which never made sense until I was an adult. And I was like, mom, mom's conflicted. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, um, yeah, so we moved and we're still in the process of moving and I'm still figuring out where the fuck I'll eventually live. I have an office downstairs in the garage, which I absolutely adore, but it's still not completely unpacked and the internet doesn't reach down there yet. Um, it's weak, too weak to do something like this. Hmm. So I elected to be here for the time being. But downstairs, my garage office looks like Tony Stark's garage. So it's fucking white with high ceilings. And you could literally park a car in there. So I pulled my car, uh, something I haven't done for 20 years. Never pulled the car into the garage at, at the La Presa house. Here, I pull into my office. I get out and my desk is there. It's kind of badass. It's very Batman. That's what it is, isn't it? I keep thinking about Tony Stark's garage, but it's literally the fucking <laughs> cave down there. <laughs> All you need is a turntable to just spin your car around. I wish. Fuck. I have to back out like a fucking normal schlub and shit like that. So <laughs> I ain't got it that good. But yeah, it is kind of cool pulling a fucking car into the garage. And then like, there's my desk. I hop out, fucking take off my cowl. <laughs> I need some trophies like memorializing a dead Jason Muse's costume or some such shit. Cock knocker costume up on the wall. <laughs> yes. That would really fucking complete the fucking effect. Um, but in any event, fuck all that. Kids, welcome to Fat Man Beyond and shit. Uh, we got so much to talk about, including yesterday was my birthday. Yes, it was. Happy birthday. Thank you. So I'm dealing, I'm doing all this 
as a sadder but wiser man. I'm 53 years old, kids. 53 mm -hmm. fucking years old. And at 53, I just realized that I did not pull the copy for our ad. Yes, there'll be an ad. There will. Spoilers. Um, it's funny. My grandfather, every every birthday, would always ask me, so what do you know this year that you didn't know last year? And my answer was like, nothing. I'm 17 years old. I didn't know Dick at 17 years old. Didn't know Dick at 18 years old. But I imagine that that question, should I ask you that? What do you know now at 53 that you didn't know at 52? Um, could be a, 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 a volume in and of itself. Oh, my God. What a year I've had. Um, I'm actually in a better place on my 53rd birthday than I was on my 52nd birthday. Remembering, like, I was in a fucking nut house not too long ago. Like it, yeah. life, life's very fast. And like, I remember after I had the heart attack five years ago, one month later, it was like heart attack. What heart attack? Cause I was just right back into it. You get two directions, kids, either you stop or you go. And sometimes like bad things happen and you got to make the choice to either just give up or fucking go forward. And, and so I have been going forward, but in the going forward part of things, you know, every once in a while, I'm like, yeah, this was a bad year. Like it was, it was pretty bad, but what I learned, what I know now that I didn't know last year is that I could survive it. That like, I know what's at the source of some of the shit that I've gone through in life or that I've continued to go through. I know that I'm insanely fucking codependent. I know that like, I'm a Mr. Fix it. Whoever wants to repair things for everybody else but myself um you know i i this is what i also know and i was just having this discussion with my wife which is like i'm sure everyone's bored as fuck but like most of our lives together like i saw this show i forget what we were watching and somebody talked about on the show like they were a parent and they had to give up so much to be a parent i never had to do that like i I, I have gotten to live exactly as I wanted to live while raising another human being. I never had to stop being the eternal teenager I was always kind of hoping to be, that I hoped being in the entertainment in the, in the field, in the arts, would afford me, right? Like, fucking part of this thing, I can't speak for Mark, but I, I think I can on some level. Nobody goes into entertainment or the arts or writing or any of that shit going like, I want to grow up. No, it's it's about arrested adolescence, childhood to some degree, because when you're a kid, that's what you do. You make pretend and you make up stories and you dream and things like that. And, you know, when you become an adult like my old man, he, you know, he didn't go to, into the postal field because he was like, I want to dream <laughs> like he took it because it was a job and it was a job that paid for his family. And most people who go into the real world and have actual jobs and shit don't spend their time trying chasing youth, which sounds way dirtier than I meant it, but chasing the ideals of youth, the like the endless summer, the, you know, let's make pretend let's dream for a living and stuff like that. And we breathe rarefied air. And as much as that's literally how we make our living, Going like, what would Green Hornet do? What would fucking Darth Vader do in the case of Mark having written his comic recently? You know, what I wake up every day and I'm I'm never like, oh, I've got all this shit I have to do. I'm like, what do I dream about doing? What dream can I put in into motion now that I could realize later on and stuff? And so because of that, I've lived a very infantilized, you know, uh, insulated life where shit simple shit like my bills are paid by somebody else um you know carol who's run my business since i was fucking a child um is the person responsible for like writing checks and making sure the lights are on i'm i'm responsible for earning all the money she's responsible for paying it out in in the last few, and, and and in addition to that like in raising our kid me and heart and jen have never done it alone jen's parents Byron and Gail lived with us forever since the kid was little and stuff. So we always had, as much as we were raising a kid, we were still getting raised ourselves. I had a whole, an entire second fucking adolescence because I lived with somebody else's parents. You know, the first adolescence I had living with my own mom and dad, 
And then like by the time I was, you know, hooked up with Jen, 28, 29, I moved into a house with her parents when our kid was born. So for the last like 24 years, 25, you go even further back where we were taking care of it. At one point, Gail was my assistant, but she also like made dinner for us every fucking night and stuff. So, you know, I'm, I would not say I'm spoiled in as much as like I've paid for all these things and whatnot and, and put in a lot of hard work to be able to pay for it. But I've always been taken care of whether or not I've, paid for that taken care of or not like that was the case now we're kind of i'm not gonna say we're on our own because carol still fucking does a lot and whatnot but like byron and gail are trying to enjoy what's left of their lives in their mid-70s and my kid has her own house and she's off and living and stuff and so oddly enough we are just now starting to do things that have been waylaid for a quarter of a century i.e writing checks like in the last month we've had to go like, do we have a checkbook, you know, and, and writing handwriting checks so much so that when you write your own checks, like I remember Chris Rock told me years ago when we were walking out, working on dogma, he was like, don't ever let somebody else pay your bills. He's going, because if you pay your own bills, you will turn off a fucking light in your house. <laughs> and I did never followed that advice. I never heeded that sage advice. Now, as I'm responsible for more for writing checks than I ever have in the last 20 years, I run around turning fucking lights off because I'm like, this, everything costs money. <laughs> well, I didn't know this because somebody else was paying the bills. So oddly enough, at age 53, I have grown up more in the last year than I have grown up in the previous 24 of them, you know, even going as far back as fucking clerks, which were coming up on the 30th anniversary in January is the 30th anniversary of, of its debut at age 53. I'm finally learning. I'm, I'm adulting, you know, <laughs> which is, I, I guess. Good. <laughs> A bit overrated. He really is like, fuck, but <laughs> But this is the time of life I'm at. Like, you know, my her parents aren't going to be around forever. As I saw from my mom this year with mm -hmm. her in the hospital for 11 weeks and us almost losing her. All of the trappings of my childhood and youth are going to slowly slip away. And for people who deal in the real world and shit, they've always understood that concept. I've always had this mindset of like, no, man, it can be the endless summer. But summer will eventually end and that is something that i've had to face in a big bad way this year and i'm happy i'm not regretful i'm not like fuck now i'm just like you know what i i i enjoyed the like the freedom of youth for a long long fucking time and now only at age 53 am i like well perhaps it's time to embrace being a grown up and winter is coming boy fucking leave it to a writer <laughs> who stole from another writer but you're absolutely right like it ain't always going to be spring and summer like at age 53 what do i got 20 25 years if i'm lucky like there is clearly less life ahead of me than behind me mm -hmm. but i'm still living like the future's so bright i gotta wear shades and that has a lot to do with the job and making pretend for a living but you know, like we just lost somebody who perhaps you want to talk about somebody who kept it young his whole life. We'll get to it by the end of the show. But like we lost the great Paul Rubens this week and it was a shock to everyone's system because he kept it kind of quiet. And you're talking about a guy who kept it really young professionally. Mm -hmm. Pee wee young for heaven's sakes. Mm -hmm. But eventually like time runs out for all of us and perhaps it's best that i embrace that now and start understanding and processing that and living a little bit more maybe one more foot in the real world than i'm more accustomed to so no complaints but at age 53 i'm like oh yeah i guess this is the year that i've grown up more than i've ever grown up historically um and no complaints like you know how could i fucking complain i for so long i didn't have to but now i'm adulting in a way that i never have fucking before so that's what I've learned to answer. Who was it? Your father, or your grandpa? Asked that <laughs> My grandfather. 
Uh, and you are broadcasting live from Winterfell. So, <laughs> yes. Look, as you can see, <laughs> I'm trying to maintain the fucking Iron Throne, and life won't have it. But the good news is, um, you know, shit like Barbie happens. Yeah, it does. Which, you know, reminds you of like, oh, yeah, life can be fun and, and, and you can get surprised by shit. Fucking like, there's a movie that I never imagined I'd be like, wow, one of the best movies I saw, I saw a year was a big commercial for a fucking doll that I never collected. Mm -hmm. Yet, wonderful surprises happen all the time and stuff. So, yeah, it's uh, look above ground is always the best place to be and every day above ground particularly at my age and is a good day so i'm i'm happy happy i had a happy birthday i didn't do anything all people like what'd you do at one point like i went out to brunch with the family like three o'clock it was me and jen and byron and gail and harley and austin and and then honestly i i slept most of my 53rd birthday i was very tired <laughs> i woke up early cuz the dogs woke me up and and i was writing and and so then during the day i was like perhaps i can now and i slept for like 5 hours of my fucking birthday but hey okay. <laughs> listen pop pop needs his afternoons <laughs> truly it doesn't matter that it's like hey this is your special day i mean look every fuck as malcolm pointed out my friend malcolm he was just like for a guy who lives every fucking day like it's his birthday, he's going, I feel like for your birthday, you should be treated like a normal human fucking being. So fuck you. He's like, I know everyone else is wishing you happiness on your special day, but you get 364 fucking special days. Why don't you just embrace the fact that you're a human being on your birthday? So uh, that's what I did this year. It's very so sweet. Enough about me. How about you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. I, uh, I've been in a promotional mode because I got a new comic book coming out what? in a couple of weeks. I got my, I got my copy here. I <laughs> saw this post. Can you see it? Oh, that's the Muhammad Ali thing. That's the Muhammad Ali, which keeps melting into fire, and it's not supposed to. I'll turn off my... I was like, what a clever cover. I know, right? Let me turn off the virtual background so that you can see the thing. Virtual background? AI is part of the problem, Mark. That's the problem we're fighting, and there you are embracing it. It's your whole background. I know I didn't mean to, uh, but there it is. The messenger, the legend of Muhammad Ali. Now, is that illustrated or no? It is. It's pretty big. Uh, who puts this out? This is a first second press. The good folks. It's a imprint of Macmillan and they just, they do graphic novels, mostly for YA audiences, but, and this is not, not a YA book, but it's, uh, it talks about some stuff. It talks about Muhammad Ali, maybe the most famous person of the 20th century. And what is the, um, how did that come about? Did you pitch it? Did they pitch you? What was the deal there? Uh, they they actually came to me. I had pitched an editor over there, uh, a, a graphic novel idea that they ultimately they didn't go for. But the pitch went very well. And so they called me in 2013 and said, hey, um, we have this this book we want to do. We're, we're, we're just looking for the right writer to do it. Do you like sports? Um we haven't found a lot of comic book people who also like sports. Do you uh, like sports? I uh, I do have a, a occasionally deep interest in sports, but kind of a glancing interest in all sport, kind of, except for like golf and maybe baseball. But like as a kid, my dad, my dad is an immigrant He's from Haiti. And so his version of immersing himself in Americana was sport. And so he would watch everything. He would watch baseball and football and hockey and tennis. He would never do golf because it's golf, but everything else he was just all about. And so I would, when I was a kid in the seventies, all you could do was watch whatever was on the television. And so he was a fan ABC's of these wide world of sports. <laughs> I'm Howard Cosell. Welcome <laughs> to the wide world of sports. Um, and boxing was another one of those things. Like the Olympics was always huge for him because he got to see his country's flag, which you almost never get to do if you're an immigrant in America. Um, and so that was just part of my upbringing was being exposed to and having like an appreciation for sports. Um, so she was looking for a sports fan who also knew how to write comics, um, who also had a bit of the journalist in them. And at the time I was still a working journalist. She's like very research heavy and doesn't hurt if you're a person of color. 
<laughs> it's like we could have hired anybody to do it, but it wouldn't be a bad idea if you're going to do a Muhammad Ali book. Yeah, so, I was going to say, like, especially if you're going to do the Muhammad Ali story for everything. Yeah, time. it's like, are you Muslim? No, I'm afraid I'm not. It's like, well, I can't get everything. <laughs> you can't have five out of five. Um, and so it, it was a long process of like doing the research and digging into the story and realizing that maybe a standard cradle to grave biography was not the best path for doing this because his life is as big as anybody's life was. Um, so instead we chose 10 moments and it was very much inspired by the, the, the Danny Boyle, Steve Jobs movie where they told Steve Jobs' life through three product launches and use those moments to be like, oh, well, here's how he was fucked up as a dad. Here, how he was fucked up as a colleague. Here, how he was brilliant as all of these things. And so we just fit, picked five moments, five rounds of a fight. I mean, sorry, 10 rounds, 10 moments, and tried to, to encapsulate a life. And then also being mindful that it's based on a true story, but not a true story. Hence, the legend of Muhammad Ali. Some of it, I just made up. Some of it was like, this feels like it could have happened. So maybe it did. Um, this I know happened, but not at this time and not in this place. Let's smoosh them all together because it's kind of better that way. And then uh, something like that, is there like, does the family get a say or? The the thing about Muhammad Ali being the most famous person in the 20th century, nobody had been written about as much as Muhammad Ali in pop culture at any rate. All of it is, I'm not going to say public domain, like the inner workings of his life are still hit part of the estate, but... Okay. The things that happened to him, the things that he said in public on the record are all available. So, you know, the lawyers were like, we actually don't need the rights. You know, they had a conversation, I think, with the estate um, that I don't think bore any fruit. So like, yeah, turns out we don't need it. And uh, and so, yeah, so I'm really proud of it. It's easier for you. You don't have to. You're not sitting there draft after draft with somebody redlining it being like, hey, you can't do this. You yeah. can't, can't say this. Can't say that. He never said that. That's not the spirit of the thing. That's whatever. One of the most public figures that ever fucking lived. You're right about like the, the biggest personality of the 20th century or the most written about. I mean, in our childhood. You could not not hear about. Muhammad Ali. I was never a sports kid. Mm. I knew about Muhammad Ali. My father yeah, I mean, was a big boxing fan, so naturally, like it was that was his sport. And and so Ali was a big part of my childhood, even though I was not into boxing. But he was omnipresent. He was yeah. one of the first people that knew how to savvily work with and use the media as well. You know, he was. He, very much like Stan Lee, he was in the business of selling Muhammad Ali and could do it better than anybody else could. Um, and he fought Superman, for Christ's sake. Like, <laughs> that's that's how omnipresent he was. He was a real person in a comic book who fought Superman to a standstill. When I was working on the Superman script years ago with John Peters, in John Peters' office, on his wall was the giant, he had a mural of... Superman of the cover of Superman versus Muhammad Ali. And I remember at one point he was, he said, he was like, you know what the sequel is? And he showed me that cover. And I was like, really? <laughs> this is the man responsible for the giant spider in the third act. He had a vision and that vision was one day Superman was going to fight Muhammad Ali. On screen. <laughs> on screen. <laughs> in the nineties, <laughs> the late nineties. You know what the kids want? <laughs> <laughs> An old box of fights. <laughs> um, so wait, so uh who hey, it's Banff Man, everybody. Give it up for Banff Man. JC's here. What's up, Banff Man? Um, I'll just throw my Muhammad Ali. The first time I remember seeing or hearing about Muhammad Ali was in Coming to America in the Muhammad Ali. Show. Yeah. That's that's my first Muhammad. memory of him. I mean, I remember him being on the Muppet show. And I think yeah. that was probably the first time that I that I recognized him outside of a boxing ring. It was like, what's Muhammad Ali? Why is he almost going to punch Kermit in the face? <laughs> he fought Superman. Why wouldn't he fight Kermit? I mean, checks out. Um, if anyone, though, you fight Miss Piggy, because she was always like, hi-ya. She's a bruiser. Yeah. She's a bruiser, that one. Ready for, ready for fighting. Yeah, so it's been, uh, you know, setting up, like, podcast interviews and doing some press and you know, starting to talk about, you know, events, potentially. I've been talking to one Mike Zapsik about a thing. Yeah, when, when, when you come out in August? Indeed. 
much like we did last time. Last time we had an Adora signing when we did the Ides of Mark. And now that we're now that we're gonna do the keep calm and curry on and a fat man, I think on that Saturday we'll do another signing at the stash. Friday, 825, August 25th is the Fat Man Beyond mm-hmm. at uh Smod Castle. Sold out kids. Woohoo! 826 on the Saturday is when we're doing keep calm and curry on. That's a double feature, the Tim Curry double feature of Clue followed by legend and that's at night so you're saying during the day at the secret stash jane Silent bob's secret stash in red bank new jersey indeed doing a messenger signing as well as signing whatever the fuck else signing whatever the fuck else at noon i believe is the time we are uh, so we- kids we're three weeks away from that make your plans accordingly man if you're anywhere on the east coast or near the east coast sounds like there's a signing in your future come on out and see mr mark bernardin signing hold it up again but in front of you, there you go, the messenger. Who is the artist? Uh, a fellow named Ron Salas, um, who uh, he is, I think he lives in Atlanta, I want to say. Um, but wonderful dude, immensely talented. Um, born in the Philippines, came to the States and decided he wanted to fucking make comic books. And God bless him for doing so, because he's amazing. Fucking A. Yeah, man. Um. And how nice to be able to talk about writing because for the last 80 plus days, the only talk about writing you've been doing is holding a sign. I know. Today's 94, I believe. Is it really? Day 94? Day 94. Next next Wednesday is the 100-day mark of the 2023 writer strike. Is that the longest it's ever gone or is the last writers guild strike equally as long? Or the short? last writers guild strike was 100 days, I think. The longest it had ever gone, I want to say it was like 130 some odd days. Um now, we were talking right before we got uh, online that uh news broke yesterday or the day before, I think, that uh the AMPTP uh negotiators reached out to the WGA about coming back to the table and talking, I think on Friday or something like that. Yeah. The, um, the Alliance of motion picture television producers, um, they, they, they reached out to set a meeting to have a discussion about opening discussions again. It's one of those. It's like when you see a trailer and there's actually a trailer right in front of it that says, this is the trailer for X. Now watch the trailer for X. It's all in the same two minutes. It's like, I don't need a trailer for a trailer, guys. Show me the trailer. It's all advertising. This is, we're setting a meeting to set a meeting. So parse that out. That's nothing but positive, right? Um, you know, it's it's a good sign given that for 94 days, there's been no conversations at all. Nothing. Um, they haven't reached out. In fact, we've seen some of the press coverage has been downright fucking horrible. Like, the, you know, as we all know, Ron Perlman was like, we know where you fucking live and shit. Yeah. You want that article. lose their houses, lose their apartments, and like, yeah. you know, lose your apartment. It's not that hard. Oh, shit, Hellboy is coming for you. Right before the SAG strike broke, and a lot of people feel like that's what pushed it over the edge. Mm-hmm. Piece, I guess it was in Deadline, where, you know, they quoted some uh, AMPTP member who was like, look, the plan is to fucking starve them out. Like, you know, when it gets close to Christmas and they got mortgages to pay, Mm-hmm. We'll wait it out until then and shit, until they're about to lose their houses. Like, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but like, it wasn't that far from yeah, what it was. Like, lose their apartments, lose their houses. We know it's going to happen. Then they'll be desperate and then they'll make the kind of deal we want them to make. Kind of like the last thing in the world you'd imagine, like, read the room, like that anyone would want out there in the world. But the the online, the, the people who are kind of pulling it apart and whatnot were theorizing that the reason that somebody like that wasn't like overheard through a glass against a wall, Mm -hmm. somebody put that information out there, hoping to scare SAG into not striking. And instead it had the absolute reverse effect where SAG was like, Oh fuck you comic book villains (laughs) and decided to strike and, and joined, you know, the WGA in the strike line as well. And then the day after that, a bunch of people were walking back those comments going like, what? I got to don't speak for us. What the fuck? <laughs> um, we never knew who that guy was, but Ron Perlman seemed to indicate that he knew who it was. 
He did. He, I mean, and maybe he does. Maybe there's some kind of hell communication that he still got wind of, um, even though he's not in the Hellboy costume anymore. The, uh, the demonic, uh, the, the demon web, he still has access to. But you know, and and, and various people and, and various studio heads have said, you know, not entirely wonderful things, not entirely well reasoned things. You know, I mean, you know, Bob David, Iger, David Zaslav just recently was like, oh, this strike saved me a hundred million dollars and it's like who's who are you mr burns like fucking again read the room man like nobody nobody out there is rooting for the fucking studio i mean that's not true uh, definitely online there have been some people who are like hollywood needs to do better anyway fuck them all but most people of course are on the side of the working person and in the beginning there were some people who were like well these millionaires just want more money and now the truth is out at across many fronts, but writers guild and SAG that like the idea of a working writer or a working actor isn't somebody who's making fucking fuck a million dollars, not even a hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, in the SAG way, you're talking about some cats who can't even reach the 26,000 a year that lets their insurance kick in. So it's not a series of rich people trying to get richer it's a bunch of people who are just trying to get paid what they're fucking do in a an ever changing fucking land business landscape where more of the pie seems to be going to upper management than fucking the people that actually do the work. So them reaching out is not like, you know, ding dong, the witch is dead. We won, but it is a positive step. It's a positive step specifically, especially because there had been no such step, you know, and especially it it is hard to explain to to people not in the business that the writers and the actors are striking, but we're not striking because we want to. We are not the ones who walked away. Um, we are not the ones who who are not willing to negotiate. It's the producers in the studios who are the ones who are forcing us to strike. And so the fact that they have now, you know, for whatever reason, decided, hey, maybe now it's time to end this thing. Maybe we found a way internally to make all of our members happy because there's there's two giant land masses within the AMPTP. There's your legacy studios, your Sony, your Paramount, your Universal, your Warner Brothers, you know, your Disney. Um, and then there's Amazon, Netflix, and Apple, right? Tech companies that moved into, into the business. And like Sony just wants to make TV shows. You know, Paramount just wants to put stuff on on CBS. You know, Universal wants to put stuff on NBC. You know, Disney, despite the fact that they also are in parks and 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 streaming and whatever, it's like Abbott Elementary is not on the air right now, and that's the show that we want to have. Like CSI is not on the air, NCIS is not on the air, anything said in Chicago is not on the air, and that's the way lots of these companies. <laughs> all of NBC slate right there, yeah, pretty much all of, all of Chicago, and then the Night Court are not on the air right now. Right. And so, you know, they are not as overwhelmingly invested in streaming the way that that Apple and, and Netflix and Amazon are. They got to get stuff on the air to sell ads. They got to get stuff on the air to to make good to their advertisers and to their buyers. Like there, there's two very different blocks that want very different things. And I feel like the legacy block is like, no, we have to be done with this. Like they're right. It's not going to cost us that much money. We'll make a really good deal. We'll be able to save face because, again, this is ridiculous that it's gone 100 days. But whatever, let's go back to work. <laughs> we need to make our money. Um, and so hopefully that's the sentiment that's that's sort of ruling the day. And that's what we're going to come into these conversations with that will lead to real negotiations that can lead to an end of the deal and end to the strike. And we can all get back to work because that's all anybody wants to do. Why now all of a sudden are they like, oh, let's go back to the table? Does it have anything to do with barbenheimer there's uh, you know barbie and oppenheimer have been undeniable boons for the box office and i don't just say that as a guy who reads the news i'm a film exhibitor you know i own a movie theater i don't know if anybody knows this but i own a movie theater called smock castle cinemas in atlantic highlands new jersey so now i see things from also another vantage point as a member of nato the national association of theater owners um, it's been a tough fucking summer, man. And like we live and die by how much popcorn we can sell, not by how many, you know, tickets, movie tickets we sell, because a large portion of that goes back to the studio. So for us, we're in the concessions business. And 
business has been bad because the movies have not been connecting. You know, Flash flushed. Um, even uh, well, fucking Shazam, Shazam prior to that, and Indiana Jones, you know, was not the savior that we were hoping, and Mission Impossible has been soft compared to like say Top Gun 2 last year. Right. Oh, so I remember like most of the summer people were writing articles about the only hope is Barbenheimer. And I remember being like, well then we're fucked. Because, <laughs> because if these movies, tried and true franchises and, and intellectual property can't save the day, how the fuck is a movie about a doll, a two hour commercial about dolls and fucking a movie about the guy who created the nuclear bomb that's three hours long. How are they the best hope for the box office? And proving that I don't know shit. (laughs) That's exactly what they were. Ernie, Smodcastle Keeper Ernie O'Donnell was was texting me photos of a line down the block, something that we only see at Smodcastle when we're doing Fat Man Beyond or fucking showing mall rats or Chasing Amy or something like that, which Chasing Amy's coming back to Smodcastle September 23rd with Joey, Laura, and Adam's tickets at smodcastlecinema.com. So... It, it, it's been a healthy period at the box office, at least at my box office, and definitely the worldwide box office, thanks to both to the double phenomenon of Barbie and Oppenheimer, truly the saviors of summer 2023. Yeah. Does that have anything to do with why the AMPTP is like, hey, we should get back to work because apparently people want to go to the movies? I mean, I think it definitely doesn't hurt. You know, I think it it definitely doesn't hurt in that this and Mission Impossible, these two movies in Mission Impossible were the last movies where stars could promote. And they did a lot of that promotion in advance because they knew like, hey, things are beginning to like, we see the tea leaves starting to coalesce. We see the tarot cards begin to flip. Let's start banking shit that we can begin to spool out over the course um, of uh, of July and, and, and early August. But they're also looking at award season. They're looking at the Venice Film Festival, the Toronto Film Festival. They're looking at fear consideration events. They're looking at the Emmys. They're looking at television, most especially. Like if they want to rescue the first quarter of 2024, if they want to have new TV on in January, February, writers need to get to work in like September in order to shoot in December and have anything ready to go by January. You know, if you want to be like making the movies for next Christmas, if you want Dune to come out and do what it's supposed to do, if you want Aquaman 2 to come out and do what it's supposed to do, then you need to have your stars out to promote it. You need to be able to hit the ground with a full court press and do that. And right now, none of that can happen. And so I think that Barbie might have been the smack in the ass to get the baby to cry and be like, oh, shit, you guys, what are we doing here? We'd like to have another billion dollar week, please. Um, Let's. Let's find a way. Let's find a way to make a way to, uh, to to get everybody back to work. And the studios have started moving 2023 movies into 2024. Um, a bunch of movies that were scheduled for the end of this year have now been pushed into next year because they're like, I guess somebody somewhere was quoted like, no movie star, no movie in terms of promotion. You know, Disney... Uh, the strike happened right before the Haunted Mansion premiere. And so the Haunted Print Mansion premiere was not Rosario Dawson and 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 uh, James Stanfield. Curtis and Lakeith Stanfield. It was Cruella DeVille is walking the carpet, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> hey, Goofy's here. Like, yeah, he literally resorted to people in costumes to have any sort of semblance of a premiere which caught any attention. And as we saw by the box office numbers of Haunted Mansion, that certainly didn't help one iota. So maybe it's just, maybe they are having a, maybe they've had their wake-up call. Maybe it's like, look, can't afford this anymore. Yeah. Fingers crossed that that discussion moves the plot forward in a way where you're right. It's like, if they want anything by January, they got to be starting fucking now. Yeah, like there's because even even if you said tomorrow, guys, strikes over, let's get back to work. You've got to like notify everybody. You've got to like office space and just time and sets and locations and all of the the, the engineering of making content needs time to get up to speed. And not the least of which is people have to write this stuff. People got to write these scripts. You know, a show, 
you know, you and I were in conversations about, you know, maybe doing a show that maybe might be on the air at some point. We're starting at ground zero on that thing. Like, yeah. We don't have any scripts because we were not allowed to write any scripts. We didn't sell the show yet. But if somebody bought the show tomorrow, it's conservatively speaking, two and a half months before we have a thing that you could shoot. And that needs the the sooner you want stuff, the sooner you got to come to the table and make a deal that uh, that makes everybody happy. And let me tell you something, kids. This show that Mark is talking about, uh, referring to, which we can't talk about, obviously, is in not just in the wheelhouse of this audience, but like in the heart, soul, and crotch of this particular audience, the Fat Man Beyond uh, audience. And who we wound up in business with, because like Mark said, we haven't sold it yet, but we did partner up with, with uh, a production company that y- we couldn't ask for better fucking placement. Like if we had gone out into the marketplace, if there'd been no writer's guild strike, chances are we would have sold this thing like that. Now, good news is with everyone having been fucking hungry for the last nearly 100 days, if the writer's guild strike gets solved and we're allowed to go out and pitch this thing, I have, I, I I feel like it's going to sell fucking fast, not just because it's a great concept, something that like, if you watch this show, it was last year, not the most recent San Diego Comic-Con, but last San Diego Comic-Con, Mark was like, I got an idea I want to talk to you about. And he was like, we didn't talk about it on the air, but backstage right after that show ended. So we're coming up on the one year anniversary. I know. Very good idea. Like I was like, oh my God, yes, yes, yes. Um, never mind the fact that it's just a good idea. They're gonna be so hungry for fucking content that I think it puts us in play rather fucking fast, man. And if this thing does what it should and could do and goes where it should and could. We're going to make a lot of people fucking happy, man. It's particularly in this audience. It's like, it, it's a very, very cool project. So yeah, we, we can't move forward on that until the fucking writer's guild strike is solved. So fingers yeah. crossed that it gets solved. Fuck. No, you're, no. I forgot about that. Like <laughs> it's been nearly a hundred days where it's like, <laughs> we're sitting in a really great fucking position. And then all of a sudden it's like, we, we can't do anything. All right. And this is just one of a thousand stories of writers who are out there just waiting to go on stuff, who are waiting. Like, I had the thing. The contracts were in hand. We had to stop negotiating. We had to, we had to, we had to. And then when it's over, like, it's going to be the fucking running of the bulls of people with ideas racing out there. And hopefully a hungry, uh, a hungry series of, of buyers who are like, yes, the pipeline is dry. Fill the pipeline. That's yeah. great. Let's go make a show. A world of yes. That's what we're hoping for at this point. Indeed. Yes, please. Um, it is, uh, you know, um, this show, kids, which uh, whether you like it or not, um, is uh, brought to you by a sponsor. <laughs> and we got to bring those sponsors on because we've been talking for a minute without even hitting up our sponsor. Uh, this week's episode of uh, Fat Man Beyond Uh, is brought to you by the kind folks, the good people, the non-objectionable. Yes. (laughs) The (laughs) the, uh, folks we've had, let's see, without going deep into it, we've had many sponsors on this show. Mm -hmm. All wonderful. One of them turned out to be pretty problematic across the boards. (laughs) Tonight's sponsor, not problematic at all, man. In fact, helpful, particularly if you've got a lot of bush. (laughs) That's right. We're talking about the good folks at Manscaped, kids. Manscaped is helping us uh, get to you today, man. Uh, And just to start with a call of action before we dive deep, you're going to get 20% off and free shipping with the code FATMAN20 at manscaped.com. Go there right now while we're talking and surf around and stuff. Cause that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code fat man, 20 manscaped beard hedger, one stroke, one guard, 20 fucking lengths, man. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to unleash the beach beast within you. This summer manscaped is here to help you level up your beach game with their new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. That's going past waist deep in the grooming game and diving in headfirst to your facial 
hair fantasies. That's right. These cats are so big, they've moved above the dick. Manscaped is now conquering your fucking face. They conquered your nuts. Now they're like, let's take the rest of the body. Let's take the face, man. Not the face. Some people say Manscaped says nothing but the face. The Beard Hedger is a game changer, allowing you to shape your beard like a true beach babe. So this summer, let the beach balls bounce. They always got that clever copy. Mm -hmm. Turn heads all over the place. Visit manscaped.com and use the code FATMAN20 for 20% off and free shipping. Go ahead, Mark. It's time to tame your mane. So say goodbye to all your stubble trouble with Manscaped's Beard Hedger Pro Kit. It all starts with a beard hedger. First off, this cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths all in one guard. So no more messy drawers full of extra add-ons. Plus it's waterproof so you can shave in the shower to avoid all that hair in the sink. The titanium coated T-blade is tough on hair but smooth on your face, leading to single stroke efficiency and brings satisfaction one stroke at a time. Pro Kit doesn't end there, though. They have created four dermatologist-tested formulations for your post-trim care. First, there's the beard shampoo and conditioner. You need to remember your hair. All your hair is different. The beard hair is more coarse and easier to damage than the hair on your head. That's why the kit is made shampoo and conditioner specially designed to moisturize, reduce ingrown hairs, replace natural oils, and promote beard health. Next, the kit has Manscaped's beard oil. This helps relieve dryness both on the beard and the skin beneath while adding a little shimmer and shine. Cap off the kit with the Beard Balm, a pomade that shapes, styles, moisturizes, and tames for a sculpted look to attract any followers, fellows, or dames. The Pro Beard Kit also comes with three free gifts, a beard brush, comb, and scissors to ensure your beard is ready to impress. What are you waiting for? (laughs) What are you waiting for, kids? Um, You're going to get 20% off and free shipping. With the code FATMAN20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped, M A N S C A P E D.com. And use the code FATMAN20. Manscaped Beard Hedger, one stroke, one guard, 20 likes. We thank the good folks at Manscaped for A, sponsoring our show, and B, being the least problematic sponsor out there. Just. <laughs> Just good folks that we don't get a thousand tweets from people going, did you see this? <laughs> we did. We did. <laughs> we did. Guess what? We had a reaction kind of just like yours. Uh, oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you to the good folks at Manscaped uh, for sponsoring Fat Man Beyond. Okay. I'm not entirely sure why uh, authentic frontier gibberish was the voice that I decided to go with. <laughs> The <laughs> Manscaped ad, but it felt right. I buy it. Well, good news is you're not a SAG member, so you can do whatever you want performance wise. Funny voices are my forte for free. <laughs> Where shall we uh begin? Uh well, we can we can start with with the 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 two-headed colossus that is Barbie and Oppenheimer. Now, have you seen Oppenheimer? I have seen Oppenheimer. All right, so, so you're one better than me, but mm. I didn't see Barbie. Excellent. Uh, I went back, I was back East last week. We did a live script reading of Superman lives for my birthday packed house. It was wonderful, but that was Saturday night. So on Friday night, I did a watch with Kev Barbie and um, man, like it, we had a good crowd. Um, you, you could pay an extra five bucks to watch it with me. And I intro and then do the long ass Q and a afterwards for a movie. I had nothing to do with, or you could pay like the 10 bucks. That's our standard fucking ticket price at Smy Castle Cinemas and watch it without me. And so the night we did watch with Kev Barbie, we had a like 140 people for watch with Kev. About 40 people who were like, nah, I don't need to watch it with him. I'm good. I just, yeah. want, to go I just want to watch a movie and get the fuck out. And I don't give a shit what Silent Bill <laughs> thinks about. It. It always blows my mind. Always crazy insulting to me where I'm like, for five bucks less, you would watch it without me? And 40 people were like, yes. So important life lesson, kids. Not everyone's going to like you. Um, You're going to be somebody's drum raising. But (laughs) it was, um, look, I I really loved Lady Bird. So I know Greta Gerwig is talented. The moment I started seeing those trailers, I was like, oh, shit, this looks like it's going to be fun. When they first announced a Barbie movie, I was like, I wasn't as 
uh, incredulous as I was when they announced a Lego movie. When they announced the Lego movie, I think on Hollywood Babylon, I was like, this is fucking dumb. <laughs> and then the Lego movie turned out to be like one of the greatest movie going experiences of, of my young life or old life. It was uh, a wonderful flick that stands the test of time. Magical. Lord and Miller magical. Um, so when they announced Barbie, you know, having learned from Lego, I wasn't like shitting on it going like, this is going to suck or anything like that. But I didn't honestly think this movie was necessarily going to be for me. When I saw their first trailer, which like had the, you know, hats off. Yes. To the filmmakers uh, or the filmmaker in this instance, but definitely hats off to, to the marketing behind Barbie because saying um, if you love Barbie, you'll love this movie. And if you hate Barbie, you'll love this movie really had me intrigued where I was like, <laughs> that's absolute confidence. Um, so I stepped into Barbie. I watched it with my kid and her boyfriend because they came back East for the script reading as well. To say that I was like profoundly shocked at how wonderful the movie is like, this movie is so much better than it has any right to be. Taking nothing away from the filmmakers, this is a two-hour commercial for a doll. Like, mm -hmm. no two ways about it. Barbie is a product. But if Barbie was a plastic doll for 50-plus fucking years, uh, Greta Gerwig gave it a soul. Like qu Quite like the Blue Fairy, she came in and, and turned it into a real live girl. This Barbie flick is fucking wonderful. Um, insanely well made. I went in for the Ryan Gosling of it all because I think he's fucking hysterical when he does comedy. And believe me, he fucking delivered. And he was the MVP of the movie as far as I'm concerned. But man, oh man, did they tell a beautiful fucking story. And Margot Robbie deserves all sorts of plaudits for carrying this movie on her fucking shoulders. Um, you know, we knew she could be funny with Harley Quinn. She's done that, but this was a tall order, man. And mm -hmm. the pairing, the dream team pairing of Greta Gerwig and, and Noah Baumbach, her boyfriend, or I think they're dating, right? They're not married. Uh, yeah. And, and and they are together in whatever you would call adult people who are together. Yeah. Um, and he's a filmmaker in his own right and has been for years and years, kicking and screaming amongst uh, other things he's done. Uh, Mr. Jealousy, if I remember correctly. Squid in the Whale, I think is his. Yeah, Squid in the Whale, which is a wonderful flick. But the, these two kids got together and wrote a fucking picture for the ages. You know, it's a phenomenon right now in this moment that's saving the box office, no doubt about it. But this movie will fucking stand the test of time, man. Um, it, it, it is... It, it's better than any movie about a fucking doll has any right to be. And just proves that in the hands of great storytellers, you can tell a great fucking story. Doesn't matter what the material is, man. There's a line in this movie that when it happened and it happened in, in the third act and JC, perhaps we should throw up that fucking spoilers thing just in case folks are like hey man don't spoil barbie but who the fuck hasn't seen this movie yet at this point it's made a 800 million dollars worldwide it's it's a hair away from hitting a billion dollars and it's only been out for fucking two weeks at this point but at one point uh the creator of barbie as played by Rhea perlman um says something that i was like i'll write my entire life and never write something so fucking beautiful when she says, like, I enjoy the movie a lot. And I was like, man, this is great. This is clever as fuck. Good on these kids. They deserve all the success and shit. This line transcended it for me to classic territory. When uh, Rhea Perlman as the Korea, as Ruth, what was her name? Uh, Handler? I don't know. Yeah, Ruth Handler, I think. The creator of Barbie. And they even got in shots there, you know, and as much as like tax evasion and shit, which if you know the, if you ever watched the toys that made us and watched the Barbie episode or ever watched a Barbie documentary, you know, it's, it, it's the lady that created Barbie who created it for her kid and named it for her daughter, Barbara had some tax issues. <laughs> <laughs> they pulled no punches. Mattel lets itself get made fun of. Um, Everybody takes a shot in this movie. 
But they had the Ruth character say this one line, which I was like, Jesus Christ. I had to write it down right away because I didn't want to forget it. And the line was, uh, she was talking about being the mom of her daughter, Bar- Barbara, who she named Barbie for. And she said, I, you know, I'm going to try to get through it without getting choked up. But she said, we mothers s- stand in place so that our daughters can one day see how far they've come. Like, yes, of course, it, it works for daughters. That works for any child of a mother. Um, mm-hmm. I am. I'm the son of a mother. And even though I'm not the daughter of a mother, and yes, I'm, I'm sure that line has even more impact for the daughter of a mother but for the it, that made me call my mother that line was so fucking beautiful and i was like mom barbie made me call you and she's like oh tiger if you're if dolls are talking to you perhaps you should go back to that mental hospital <laughs> um, but that's that that line a line that fucking good has no right to be in a movie about a fucking doll and yet here we are man it's like that's it was some wonderful, wonderful shit. Funny as fuck. Tells the story of, you know, Barbie fucking going through an existential crisis and then leaving Barbie land, which is hysterical, <laughs> and coming to the real world and whatnot. You know, I understand there's some folks, of course, who are like, I got issues with this movie because they go at, you know, men hard. I I felt they went at everyone hard. You know, I I, I felt like no one was left unscathed it's a satire to say the least right would you classify and qualify this movie as a satire i think i think i think it totally qualifies as that i mean it is a lot of things all at the same time right like it's 100 percent satire it's also like a sort of deep commentary on like the commodification of feminism you know and like the a, a scathing kind of look at the shallow simplicity of the patriarchy right Horses, my mojo dojo casa house. Like, I, I just got to have this for. <laughs> I thought it was fucking hysterical how into horses you <laughs> and, and at one point, Ryan Goss, uh, Ken, who is an, an essential part of this fucking movie. Um, because historically, he's always been and Ken. Mm hmm. Um, but when he was just like, I lost interest in the patriarchy when I found out it wasn't about horses. <laughs> <laughs> like such a fantastic line it was such a fucking funny movie and adorable um but real and yeah. real fucking smart uh clever within an inch of its fucking life firing on all cylinders like as a writer i was like fuck I gotta step up my fucking game man because if you could do this with a studio movie This is a big ass Warner Brothers fucking movie that was, you know, engineered to make a lot of money. Budget of this movie is is a hundred million and change. Mm -hmm. They used up all the pink paint in the world, apparently. God, and and they're clearly it's meant for mass consumption, and anything meant for mass consumption is usually spoon fed to the audience and kind of non-offensive across the board so that everybody can enjoy it and yet what makes this movie so powerful is that it pulls no punches and does take risks which for a movie of this size and a studio movie is it's not normal like risks are not taken the only risk that a studio is used to making is the financial calculated financial risk of how much it costs versus how much it could make but to let her get away with what she got away with in the storytelling of this movie, it it really just shows that, like, let more artists take fucking chances, even with gigantic movies that are meant to please across the boards. This is what they call a four-quadrant movie, or at least what they were aiming for. And yet on paper, it would seem that perhaps it wasn't designed to be a four quadrant movie and yet somehow works as one. Am I crazy? I mean, I think that, that the, the dirty secret of the four quadrant movie was always the important quadrant was men between 18 and 34. And if we got any other quadrant, we'd be happy about it, you know, but like, we're going to make this pirate movie. Who are pirate movies for? For fucking dudes kind of always have been 
all right, but we're going to put, you know, Kira Knightley in here and we're going to have Johnny Depp and he's going to be fun. So old people will like it there and Kira Knightley will, you know, ladies will like it because Kira Knightley's there and it'll, it'll grow past that. But we know we just got to get the boys. This is a movie that's like, it's a four quadrant movie, but the first pillar of those four quadrants are women. You know, and it's the the meme that's been going around, which is kind of apt, is that Barbie is Black Panther for white women. <laughs> which I'm like, yeah, you is know? that is that what people are saying? Yeah, and it's like you're kind of right in that, like if you were if you were a black person, you were going to see Black Panther because they had never made a movie like that before, that was very specifically about you and culture and 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 that part of the world and all that. They've never made a movie of this scale for women, you know, and that has production design within an inch of its life, you know, had great new music, you know, had, you know, movie stars that you could relate to about le leaving one world and going into another world, about how those worlds are changed because of that, that, that transaction, about how your villain thinks that maybe the way this world has been operating this whole time is wrong because I've learned some stuff about the modern world and I've got to bring it back to this other world. Like, Ken is Killmonger in that movie. Ken is <laughs> to Wakanda with a vision for how the world should work, how we should change it. We need more horses and jackets, guys. Everybody gets to have a Mojo Dojo Casa house. But I don't know what you're going to do, old person who used to be the ruler of this place. You got to find a place or not, or we got to have a showdown. And it's kind of not, it's not the same movie, but it does a lot of the same things. And and so this was a movie about, hey, you know, 52% of the population is women. What if we just gave them a movie and would be happy if guys came along? And I think that's kind of what happened is like every woman felt the need to go see this movie because if you love Barbie, you're going to go. If you hated Barbie, you're going to go. And nobody has a complicated feeling about Barbie like women have complicated feelings about Barbie. <laughs> and they like, like they pull no fucking punches. Like it is not presented as like, you know, hey man, everyone loves Barbie. It's presented in the movie proper. Mm -hmm. Like some people are like, I fucking hate there are characters that are like, I fucking hate Barbie. Yeah. Like, it's it's mind bending how much how how it would be like making an Indiana Jones movie and being like you know half the time you're like well he's a grave robber isn't he that's bad like it, it's just there it's there like, shouldn't you leave this where it is indy but yes. it's a museum no it belongs to the people you stole it from put they, it back they i cannot think of like a recent movie where the main character isn't like lionized particularly when the main character is a fucking product that they want to sell and continue to sell and has historically sold like they you get to see the strings in this movie. The fact that Mattel let them go as hard as they go at Mattel. And, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's still, I reel from like, I can't believe they got away with this. This ain't, we're not even talking a mad magazine level of ribbing. This is like a national lampoon level of ribbing in terms of like what they did with their subject matter, which their subject matter has been a sacred cow for 50 fucking years, man. That Mattel was like, go ahead. Like, take the gloves off. Make fun of Barbie. Make fun of Barbie's audience. Make fun of us. Mm -hmm. it just makes it that much more wonderful because you don't feel sold to. Like, when I did the Q&A after the movie, I was like, I mean, we literally just, let's make no bones about it. We just watched a two-hour commercial. That being said, did you feel sold to? Not at all. Mm -hmm. It was it was a miracle. It's no wonder why the movie is doing the business it's doing and why it's exciting people and bringing people back to the theaters, man. Like you're you want to talk about making something for an underserved audience, heavens. Yeah, but, and like the thing that I that I was astonished by was that. I'm not sure you could have made a movie that says all of the things about feminism and patriarchy and and uh, and and corporate greed and all that stuff without it being a Barbie movie. I think Barbie is the vehicle that lets you tell that story. 
And so, like, if, let's say that that Greta Gerwig was like, I ought to do like Little Bird. I want to do a thing about the patriarchy and feminism and what that all of that means. Give me twelve million dollars, and I'm going to make an indie about it. I don't know if that works as well as it does with a Barbie in it, because Barbie is that totem. It is that fucking fertility god that lets you tell all of those stories and lets you have them mean something, because it, it becomes rooted in our own collective kind of pop memory. We all know what it is. We all think we know what it means. But what does it mean, even to its intended audience? Who is Barbie? You know, and to have a movie that just interrogates that. Like, what does it mean to be this fucking doll? What does it mean to live in this prefab paradise? What does it mean to be a girl who played with Barbies? And what does it mean to realize that you are never going to be able to attain the lofty goals that Barbie set for you? What, if it, what does it mean to just be like, kind of okay, Barbie? Is that a thing you can be happy being? Just regular, non-problematic Barbie. Or I'm fucked up Barbie. I'm weird Barbie. There's a really beautiful part in the movie. I was talking to um, my friend Kim about it. She was talking about the the moment in the in the flick, which I remember when it happened. I was like, oh, maybe this will pay off later on. But it didn't, but it didn't need to pay off later on. When Barbie's in the real world and she's sitting on a bench next to an old lady. That moment broke my heart. Like, it's so beautiful. Where she just looks at her and she's like, you're you're really beautiful. And, you know, I was like, all right, what's the payoff? And that was the payoff that somebody's so fucking fake and plastic, somebody who will be eternally young, eternally beautiful, looked at someone real and saw something missing in herself. That's what I kind of missed in that moment and didn't understand until it was explained to me later on. But the notion of like the reason why she was like, you're really beautiful is because she has never been that and would never be that on mm. the path that she was. And there is something really beautiful about being human, about aging, about not looking fucking perfect. And it, it that like, and that moment happens not in like the third act. No. Yeah. But like in the first few moments of when she gets to the real world, which happens pretty early in the flick. Yeah, it's like, the bridge between act one and act two. It, it, you know, this movie is fucking special, man. And like, you could work your whole fucking life trying to make a movie like this, trying to make something that connects like this, trying to do something within the system. This ain't an independent fucking flick where it's just like, hey, man, I get to do whatever I want because like it's a no budget movie. This movie was made within the fucking system. Like I'm I'm really happy for her, man. Like that's she's only what? 3 movies in on her career technically? Like Little Women, Lady Bird. Bird. Like uh, Lady Bird, Little Women. Did I feel like there's something else in there but I we'd have to do a quick IMDb check. But in terms of like movies with budgets and shit like that. Yeah. This and, is a glow up. If this reminds me of like Spike Lee hitting fucking do the right thing third time out. Mm. Jesus Christ. Like, <laughs> I don't envy you. You're going to have to learn to fucking surpass this or try for the rest of your career. And most of us would be happy to have one of these and stuff. But man, oh man. Fucking phenomenal. Like, warm, wonderful, funny, biting just good and anybody out there that hasn't like given it a shot yet like going oh i think i know what this movie is you don't you don't you really don't like you know and i know we're fucking couple of softies and shit and we're not exactly like mount rushmore for the patriarchy me and mark and and but even i who about as liberal as it gets and i would say mark probably the same way was flabbergasted at what this movie was versus what I thought it might be. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I remember Mark hit me before he saw it before I did. And he was like, have you seen Barbie? And I said, not yet. I'm going to see it this weekend. And I believe you just wrote wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Or this movie's great, like legit great, you know? And also the idea that as shallow as Barbie, as shallow as Barbies can be as the movie presents it, Everybody can be a Barbie. 
you know, like there's black Barbie, there's white Barbie, there's Asian Barbie, there's fat Barbie, there's differently abled Barbie, there's trans Barbie. Like it's just Barbies all the way down. And like that level of, of both awareness of the audience, what the audience is looking for and the subtle fucking jabs at who gets to call themselves a woman, who gets to call themselves beautiful, who gets to be in the spotlight. And like everybody does, you know, and it's, it is not at all the message of the movie, but it's all there. It's all text. And if you're reading the text, then you get it. If you don't, I mean, you're going to be the dude who's just pissed off because it's anti-male. It's like, it kind of is. And that's also kind of fine. <laughs> like, does it hurt that bad to not have one movie that caters to you? <laughs> like, <laughs> again, that's why it's, you know, Black Panther for white ladies. <laughs> like, but it, it oddly never felt like oh my God, I'm being talked down to. Like, no. I was watching that movie, I was never like, I'm being alienated. And like, it, I I felt like, I don't know, I just felt like I got ribbed like everybody else got fucking ribbed. I felt <laughs> like I took it no harder as a man than Mattel did as a fucking corporation. <laughs> like, if you're not, if you can't fucking laugh at yourself or at the reality of what the world truly is like outside of Barbie land, you know, I I feel bad for you. Like, everyone has to be able to have a sense of humor about themselves and about the world we live in. How else do you fucking get through? Yeah. We live in. Um, hats off to uh, America. Is it America Ferrara? Yeah. yeah. You know, unsung hero of this movie. Like, because Margot is fucking dazzling. Ryan Gosling is fucking fantastic. But, like, you need a human being in the store. I mean, Will Ferrell is fantastic, but he's barely playing a human being. He's also something of a fucking doll himself in the yeah. movie. Like, I feel like Will Ferrell is always like, this might be a bit too much Will Ferrell. <laughs> Will, Will Ferrell having a pass key and hurling it at the gate <laughs> for it to open and for him to get out of the building was like one of my favorite moments in a, one of my favorite comedic moments in a movie theater this year. He's trying to get to a turnstile. You need a pass key to get through it. And he takes his, he's like so corporate and so above it all that he does not know how to get through the turnstile. <laughs> so he takes his pass key and he hurls it like this at the gate. It doesn't open. He's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but America Ferrara, like, really, like, I, I, I don't know much. To, like, what was that? Was she Ugly Betty? She was Ugly Betty. Yeah, that was I don't her. Know fucked with much that she's been in but she was fucking phenomenal yeah no she's really strong because in, and to your point she's she's the human person who gets to explain to barbie what the real world means and what it's like you know and then to have a daughter who doesn't like because that's that whole story is the daughter didn't like barbies and she loved them and but her complicated relationship with the barbie changed as she grew up and you know the barbie who thinks about death is yeah. all that's america ferrara <laughs> That kid was was great too, man. Like uh, her, the kid who played her her daughter. Uh, the whole thing is fucking exceptional. And uh, you know, a movie like this only comes along when it happens. It ins instills you with hope that, like, oh my god, like there could be more like this. I I didn't, hadn't even thought of the Black Panther parallel, but you're absolutely right. It's like holy shit, this is a phenomenon, yeah. and it's a phenomenon that's serving an audience that doesn't normally get served. But because of that we all get served like it's not like oh man i'm fucking left out. i'm moses sitting on the hill outside the promised land like it raises all boats yeah yeah it's the specific story that becomes universal because it is specific and, and that's the best and imagine it. imagine being able to pull off that magic act once in your fucking life as an artist yeah. let alone fucking to ever do it again i mean it's it, it boy it was a fucking great time at the movies that reminded me of like oh yeah like movies can be a lot of fucking things man just like barbie can be a lot of fucking things movies can also be a lot of fucking things even at this level mm -hmm. you know indie films you expect like all right they got a soul and fucking they're not just in it for the buck this is a movie that by all rights should have and could have just been in it for the buck. Yeah. And somehow they let it be what it is. And because of that, there's a bunch of kids out there going to grow up seeing this movie, boys and girls who are going to be like, 
oh, that's what a movie could be. Yeah. Not just one fucking thing that, you know, entertains or fucking passes two hours. It can do all that and make you think and make you feel movies are very good at making you feel. And, and most of the time it's artifice. This is a movie literally about a fucking product predicated in artifice that somehow makes you fucking feel more human watching it. That's about the best review I could possibly give that movie. Um, it's all about plastic, but fuck it made me feel like flesh and bone and soul and heart. Happy. I'm happy having seen that movie so much so that I'm going to go back again. Yeah, go for it. It's a, it's a quicker watch than Oppenheimer. Yeah. Let's segue over to Oppenheimer, man. Um, I mean, listen, Oppenheimer, you know, the movie you're going to get to a certain degree with Oppenheimer. It's, it's a bit like, like like Titanic sooner or later, there's going to be an iceberg. (laughs) (laughs) I bet you they're going to build a bomb and I bet you it's going to work. Like, like the story of Jesus. Sooner or later, there's a third act where you're like, uh-oh, Jesus, look out. <laughs> They're coming with a cross. Yes. <laughs> um, but, but getting the, there, that's the question. The In- getting there is, is the thing. And they somehow make a movie, and by they, I mean Christopher Nolan, makes a movie that feels like a thriller that has no thrills. Because there's no moment of, oh, shit, we lost the formula for the bomb. Like, everything kind of goes the way... It goes, you know, and yet there's this pull to it. There's this drama to it. There's this inertia to it, especially as you get to the middle of the of the second act where it's they've built Los Alamos. They built the, the town in the middle of nowhere. They've recruited the scientists that are going to be the part of the Manhattan Project. And, you know, they're building the bomb that it begins to just feel propulsive in a way that does not involve car chases or shootouts or 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 suspense as we conventionally know it. But it's all just people trying their best to do the impossible thing that nobody's ever done before. Um, there is not a bad performance in this movie. Like, everybody is great. Killian Murphy is phenomenal. Florence Pugh remains, you know, unbeaten at being Florence Pugh. Um, you know, like... Oh, Matt, how's Matt? Matt, you know, Matt, is, he, he's, he seems to have settled into this kind of avuncular guy who gets stuff, gets stuff done for geniuses. Like... In Ford versus Ferrari, he's kind of playing the same role and that he's got this race car driver that nobody wants to trust, but he believes in. It'll make you move heaven and earth that let him run, you know, Le Mans or the Monaco, whatever that is. Here it's, I've been told you're the best person in the world who can do this. So I'm going to give you everything you need to do this. Tell me when we can test it. Tell me when we can set it off. But he's great as, you know, your fucking Nick Fury of scientists collecting people to make the Avengers of setting off bombs. If, if they, they, you know, when we were kids or in our 20s, they made a movie about the making of the bomb called Fat Man and Little Boy. Right. Who is playing the Paul Newman part in this movie? Um, I think it's it's Matt Damon. It is Matt, right? That's what yeah. I got from the trailer. I was like, oh, I think he's doing the Paul Newman thing. Yeah. Not to compare the two remotely, but they are about the same subject. They're about the same subject matter. Um, and so, like, it's a, it, it. It plays a little, I'm not going to say fast and loose with history, because there's the history that it's very much committed to. And then there's the history that it's like, eh. like there's this moment where the Matt Damon's like, so where should we build this fake town that we need to build? Where should we test this bomb? And they're in the middle of New Mexico and and Robin, Robin, uh <laughs> Hey, JC, put up the spoilers thing, man. I mean, I know it's tough to spoil a movie that's history, but still, we are. <laughs> I don't want to get yelled at. Right. And so he's in the middle of, you know, he's like, where should we go? And so they go, they cut to the middle of New Mexico. And uh, and Oppenheimer's like, there's nobody around for a thousand miles. You could build your city right here. We can test the bomb right over there. Everything will be fine. Historically, it was filled with like Native Americans and Mexican immigrants and people who had to be displaced in order to build a city. Some people who were not displaced and, you know, were were too close to the bomb site and all got like leukemia in a couple of years afterwards. Like the idea that nobody was there is this like, huh, interesting. Okay, sure thing, filmmakers. Um, but listen, it's, 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 it, I don't know how they make this movie. Like I was literally watching it and I stopped 
being able to notice the filmmaking and just got kind of hypnotized by the story itself, which is exactly what you want as a filmmaker. Like stop paying attention to the artifice, stop paying attention to the, the artificiality of narrative in this way and just get kind of just invested in it. And I was. What was the black and white versus color? What was the... Um, they do some time hopping. You know, it's, it's one of the framing devices is a, a sort of inquest hearing that Oppenheimer is subject to, where people come in and are interviewed and have to tell stories about this time that we're watching the prime storyline. There's the black and white stuff, which is very much about Robert Downey Jr. as uh, he was the head of the atomic... Uh, advice committee or something like that that would tell Truman's government um, what to do and how to deal with what they had built, you know, the atom bomb and then a hydrogen bomb and so forth and so on. And so Robert Downey Jr. is being confirmed for a, a, a cabinet post, the secretary of something or other. And so all the black and white stuff is sort of that part of the hearing where how that reflects back on his time with Oppenheimer in, in the post war era and then more flashbacks to the building of the bomb and all it's, it's very it's a little dunkirk in the way it deals with time and narrative um robert downey jr is amazing you know it's he playing he plays um a guy named uh, strauss i think who um who was a patron of oppenheimer's who was running university and had Oppenheimer come in and be the like the provost or the dean of atomic whatever. Um, it's the I'm going to get the Oscar that I didn't get for Chaplin role for Robert Downey Jr. Um, I feel like he 100% gets a supporting actor nomination, if not the win. For that. Somebody um, described the movie. I forget who it was. I, I don't know if it was my friend John Pearson, but they were like, it's Amadeus. And yeah. Robert Downey Jr. is Salieri. There's a bit of that. I mean, he's not involved with the building of the bomb itself. He's not part of the, the Manhattan Project. But it's the jealousy of a guy who's lived his life close to scientists, but is not a scientist. You know, a guy who has been surrounded by greatness, but cannot lay that same claim. You know, and and even it, it's it's weird because you watch that movie and you're always a little bit like, like the 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 Leonardo DiCaprio meme from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you're like it's it's that part, it's that part. He said the thing the first time he says, "Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds." You're like he said the thing that we know he says, and you see the various scientists. You're like, "Oh, that's Niels Bohr. I remember that name from somewhere." And oh, that's that guy. And there's oh, that guy. That guy's cool. Like if you're at all a bit of a science nerd, it becomes like whack-a-mole of famous science people. So, is that Einstein over there? Is that him? Did his hat just blow up? That's probably fucking Albert Einstein, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah. I know history. <laughs> I know he equals MC squared, don't you? But like it's it's a fast three hour sit. Um, and it's worth it's worth sitting through because it is it's somewhat um majestic filmmaking. Um but I can't say I had a better time than I did at Barbie. Um, it sounds like he's got a, a future, this this uh, young filmmaker, Chris Nolan. This Nolan fella, you know, I, I think he's got a, he holds promise. That's off to that guy, man, because I'm telling you, like, you, you, you make the movie sound incredibly compelling. And I'm definitely, oddly enough, my wife wants to see, like, Oppenheimer so hard. And I was like, Barbie, man, Barbie. And she's just like. Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, of the, you would imagine it would be vice versa, but I was, you know, I was way more interested in seeing Barbie than I was Oppenheimer. Um, and of course I was always going to see Oppenheimer, but I think your cell pushed me over the edge, particularly your cell with Robert Downey Jr., who is like one of my favorite actors. Yeah, he's great. I took my son to see Oppenheimer and I was very surprised when he asked to go. I was like, I was thinking about going to the movies. Like, oh, you want to see Oppenheimer? I was like, wait. You're 19 years old. Why do you want to see Oppenheimer? Um, but he dug it. Like we left the movie. It's like, oh man, that was intense. That's his version of that was really good. That was intense. It uh, opened fucking huge. Like, you know, considering it's a three hour movie about the making of the nuclear bomb and has no fucking superheroes in it unless you consider Oppenheimer <laughs> like Reed Richards or some such shit. Um, but it, like what 87 million or something like that was their opening 
Yeah, I mean, they opened incredibly strong, 80, 82 million opening right now it's worldwide at $419 million. That is a, those are comic book movie numbers. Yeah. Movie about history. Um, once again, you know, you could take any subject matter, even something as familiar as this, you give it to the right talent turns it into something else transcends the medium um not just business wise because it's doing killer fucking business but like people are dressing up to go see this movie dressing like fucking oppenheimer wearing hats again yeah. like in the fucking 50s or some such shit hat squad yeah man that's it's crazy um i do look forward to seeing it. i think i'm gonna see it this weekend um i always feel like you know fucking a, i own a movie theater so i feel like I'm betraying my movie theater if I go to <laughs> movie theaters, but I'm going to have to break down and actually go see it perhaps at a movie theater out here in Los Angeles. Did you see it in 70? My friend Vincent Pereira, who is a big fucking gearhead when it comes to movies, man. Um, he went to see it. He lives out near Detroit. He went to see it in 70 millimeter. And he was like, while it looks beautiful, he goes, this is a talking head movie. <laughs> it's like you're not really gonna miss anything because i was like should i track down a 70 millimeter screening which by the way is difficult um the 70 millimeter imax screenings are like sold out for weeks in advance still even now yeah and so they added a 6 a.m at the chinese in 70 millimeter could you imagine i mean waking up at 6 a.m to watch a three-hour movie about the <laughs> making of the nuclear bomb um but uh, he, he, you know, he wasn't dismissive of going, ah, fuck 70, because he's that guy. He loves 70. He was like, you should shoot your next movie in 70. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he's going, it's a talking head movie. So you're not going to miss anything by not seeing it in 70 million. He's like, it's not like it's a series of sweeping Vista shots. And right. He's going, but inarguably, it's fucking gorgeous. And seeing it in that format is amazing. He's going, but considering it's a lot of people talking, you can see it anyway. He's like, look, just see it. That's the point. Yeah, I didn't see it in 70 because to your point, it was a little difficult to. I want to see it again. And I feel like the second go round, I'll track down and I'll wait. Like I'll give it a couple of weeks, you know, a month. And and then I'll go see it at uh, at the Chinese or at, I think the, uh, the City Walk out here has a 70 projector that's doing it. Uh, it's not everywhere, but you can find it. And that, that gets to be your loophole, right? That's how you're not cheating on your movie theater. Because you don't have it in 70 in New Jersey. So well, don't fucking tell people that we don't have a 70 millimeter theater. <laughs> like fucking let them find out after they bought a ticket and they're in there and they're like, where's the 70 millimeter? Like, we ain't got one. Yeah. Here's what I want. I want 70 and I don't want Kevin Smith here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trust me, there'd be at least 30 to 40 people who are like, oh, I ain't paying to watch it in 70 millimeter with Silent Bill. Fuck that noise. I mean, I got to the point, like, I'd been invited, I and mean, this, again, this is the shittiest first world thing to say, and I know, but I've been to enough movie premieres that I'm now at the point in my life where I'm like, hey, you know what? Uh, thank you for the invite. I will pay to go see it because I get to go in and I'll get out. And there'll be no security. I don't have to check my phone. I don't have to deal with the crowds. Like, I'll go to a matinee of this shit. I'll see it for 15 bucks, and then I'll bounce. I love that Chris Evans is going to be in the house. I don't need him to be <laughs> famous people, man. They make everything better. Don't they? Um, so two gigantic movies um, uh, that we saw one of them. We both saw one of them. And then one of us saw the other, um, which we couldn't say enough good things about like full recommend, full throated recommendations for both. It sounds like. <laughs> Absolutely. At least for me, you got them. Um, all right. So there you go, kids. There's your there's your movie reviews. Uh, tonight, I believe the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comes out. Yeah, I'm going to hopefully see that on Saturday. Uh, and word has been very positive. I believe they're fucking got a great rating on Rotten Tomatoes. People seem to like what's going on there. Yeah, I mean, it looks... Seth Rogen joint, no? Indeed. I mean, it, and it looks very much like... Oh my God, it is. looks fucking beautiful. It looks like it exists the way it does because Spider Verse exists the way it does. Like they, it's like they took the Spider Verse baton and carried it even further. And it, it just it looks like art, which is kind of what you want out of the movie. It looks a little messy, which is what you want out of a, a movie based on independent art. So I'm here for it. Um, all right, I'm looking for a power source for my fucking 
Uh-oh. You're winding down? Yeah, I thought I had a plug here, but then they're just laptops telling me this plug ain't doing it. I, I have a feeling my computer is going to sad Mac soon. Like, Ooh. I know it's it's been it's shut down twice in the last two days, apropos of nothing. And, you know, I so much so that I was like, boy, I better back up some shit. <laughs> but it might be time for a new one. And don't they make this shit to like eventually break down on purpose? Did I read that someplace? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like they used to make cars that would last you like 30 years. And now you get five, six, maybe, you know, you get three good years out of a laptop and then it, shit just starts to get funky. Like the battery power in phones are kind of designed to begin to lose their charge after years. Allegedly, do not come and sue me, Apple. Um, I better stop trying to plug it in lest it fucking sad Mac while I'm in the middle of the show. Um, no, that's all right. We got a half an hour left anyway. Yeah, that's true. We got shit to do, kids. All right, let's talk about uh the other let's talk about some news. Let's hit some news real quick. Um apparently, allegedly, according to an interview with comicbook.com, Gal Gadot might be back for Wonder Woman 3 after all. Um, in promoting her movie, uh, Heart of Stone, which may or may not be coming out on a platform that may or may not be a streamer, um, she alluded to hearing from the new DC bosses, James Gunn and Peter Safran, about developing a third Wonder Woman movie together. Uh, I love portraying Wonder Woman, get it out said uh, about the third movie. It's so close to and dear to my heart. From what I've heard from James and from Peter is that we're going to develop a Wonder Woman 3 together which is a somewhat reversing, of course, from kind of everything we'd heard before the Patty Jenkins of it all that she, she sort of left the movie after, you know, I guess pitching it to, to, to James and to Peter who maybe didn't cotton to it too much. Um, And we don't know if she has anything to do with Superman legacy, which will be, you know, kick off in 2025. We know that there's a new Superman. We know that there's going to be a new Batman at some point. And so is it possible that she's the only real holdover from the previous version of the DC extended universe? Who knows? So it's still wet clay, but I mean, it, it looks, it looks like at the very least there's conversations. So good for all parties concerned. <laughs> she was a good, I, I loved Wonder Woman. That was a wonderful flick. Um, we got to see her a little bit in flash, but a lot of people were like, ew. <laughs> or to flash um uh, let's talk about lando lando yeah lando's a quicker talk than aquaman 2 because we have a lot to talk about aquaman 2 but um but about a week ago or so justin simeon the director writer director of the haunted mansion was on the the red carpets um the only member of the the creative team who could be because according to his contract with the, the director's guild he still had to promote the movie that he made even though he was on strike as a writer um, but he talked about, he was asked about the Lando show and he was like, as far as I know, it's still happening. I think so, but I haven't heard in a while. And then this week we heard what is happening with the Lando show, which is Donald Glover and his brother, Stephen Glover have signed on to write Lucasfilm's Lando series for Disney plus. Um, apparently the deal was made prior to the writer strike. Uh, so it was not in an act of negotiations and I guess just now came out. It's hard to to really understand why now was the time they decided to release this information other than people were talking about Lando, I guess. Um, but, you know, he, Donald Glover has always, um, and by always, I mean, for the last couple of years, talked very warmly about playing Lando and said, I would love to play Lando again. It's a fun time being him. It just has to be the right way to do it. Time is precious. The past couple of years, this pandemic shit really had people experience time. People realize their time is valuable. Uh, it just has to be the right thing, and I think it could be. Lando was definitely somebody I like to hang out with. It was a quote from GQ back in April. So, if you love Donald Glover, if you loved Atlanta, if you love his version of Lando, it seems like you're going to get a completely uncut Donald Glover Lando show. I'm here for it. I thought he did a great job in Solo, man. Yeah, I mean, I haven't I haven't rewatched Solo in a long time. Like, I just remember not loving it in the theater. Um, and I have never revisited it, but, but I remember he was certainly not the part of the problem. No, I remember he was he was having a blast, and the, which is kind of exactly what you want from from a young Lando. Just be kind of having and, uh, people seem to love Atlanta, so you know it's not like he's very talented. 
So give uh, yeah. let him control the material for heaven's sakes. Absolutely. He knows what he's doing. Um, Aquaman 2 uh, and the Kingdom of Reshoots. Uh, according to this, uh, this Hollywood Reporter article, um, they've now gone through three rounds of reshoots for the James Wan movie. Uh, the sequel to the 2018 film that made uh, $1.148 billion. The highest grossing DC movie of all time. was. I was going to say, like, this is a movie that made a billion dollars. Yes. More than a billion dollars. So naturally, it behooved them to like, let's do it again. Let's but do it again. It's been troubled, to say the least, it sounds like. To say the least. Um, the third round of reshoots is is an almost an unprecedented number, even for a movie this scale. Um, it was supposed to come out um, in December of 2022. It's now potentially coming out in December 20th of 23, depending on if this is a thing that gets moved because of the active strike or not. Um, it's endured three regimes at Warner Brothers. Um, Toby Emmerich and Walter Hamada were one regime. And then when the Warner Brothers Discovery merger happened, Mike DeLuca and Pamela Abdi, who were the new Warner Brothers film bosses who came involved, um, They've had at least two rounds of reshoots between summer of 2022 and beginning of 2023 and had a bunch of uninspiring test screenings. Um, then DeLuca and Abdi got involved, um, but that even led to another round of reshoots because their editorial version, specifically Pamela Abdi, got involved and her version was testing lower than previous versions. It's And then they got to wrestle with the Batman of it all. Like Walter Hamada had wanted Michael Keaton's version of the character to be like Nick Fury in the Marvel movies and Elder Statesman who can pop in. He was supposed to be in Batgirl, clearly The Flash, also The Lost Kingdom. But then when Batgirl went away and the release date shifted, they decided that like not let's not promise a version of Batman that people are not going to see going forward. So Ben Affleck did a round of reshoots. And then that's a version of Batman we may not ever see again. So then they decided to pull Batman out almost entirely, I think. Um, and then more test screenings were this February, but by now James Gunn gets involved and Peter Safran. And now, so Gunn is weighed in on the most recent cut, approved another five day version of reshoots. Like this is just the movie that keeps on getting made over and over and over again. It started at a $205 million budget, which during the pandemic is when it, it, the first round of, of the initial production was. And that becomes an expensive proposition. And now all of these reshoots are just adding to that tally. I, you know, it sounds like a mess. Uh, it's hard to tell. Oh. JC is the host now. Um, I don't even know if we're online. He said it's oh. coming back. Bam. Okay. Yeah, my internet just went nuts. Uh, hold on. I'm going to put the screen up and... Mute us for a second, and then we'll be right back. Uh, hold on. I think it's Valley Heat or something. Uh, we'll be right back. I'm going to get everything back online. Okay, we're back. We're good. Hey, everybody. everything's fixed. Hey, kids. Sorry about that. Uh, we're two of us. I think all three. I see two of me. Is Mark? Is right. Mark? No. There, there we go. Hello. Um, all three of us are now in the valley. Oh, now it's me again. Is this something I should worry about, JC? I got it fixed. Just... Okay, yeah. got it fixed um all three of us are in the valley and valley heat may be fucking killing killing us somehow yeah rolling you know, brownouts internet's gonna internet uh so let's let's uh make sure that we get to everything before we lose fucking power <laughs> uh, aquaman sounds like it's doing great <laughs> barreling steamrolling toward the december 20th release 
No, Are they really? so, so they're they haven't oh, announced December, a movie yet. December twenty. They haven't announced a movie yet, but I think that Warner Brothers is is maybe buoyed by by Barbie, maybe trying to hold the course and keep their fall slate the way they they designed it. But I think much will much will tell in the next couple of weeks, depending on strike business. They could charge me fifty dollars a ticket just to see the cut Michael Keaton, <laughs> Ben Affleck Batman stuff. Just make it Aquaman two. The lost Batman scenes. <laughs> I don't care how long it is. I'll overpay to see that shit. No, uh, Gotham. How the fuck does something that like, I mean, I don't know. I've never worked at that level, but like the first one was a runaway fucking hit. All you got to do is more of the same. And for some reason, boy, they fucking hit wall after wall after wall, water wall with this shit. Yeah, man. I don't, I don't know. Aquaman 2, Titanic. <laughs> Aquaman hitting the iceberg. Um, Jason Momoa always seems like such a nice guy. It's a shame. But he was out there in the press going like, look, I gave him ideas and they didn't want to hear my shit. So even he was kind of backing off of the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. All right. Let's, let's hit the sadness. And then sad, man. I, I have one more. I have one quick, weird piece of news which is uh, Magic the Gathering, which is like the grandfather of all uh, playing card games. Right. Uh, released a Lord of the Rings set of cards. And there was a single one ring card that they only mm -hmm. made one of, like Sauron's one ring. One out of all the cards they printed. And Post Malone just bought that card from the Canadian guy who f got it in a pack for two point six million dollars. I've, I've never wanted to be a Canadian guy more in my fucking life. <laughs> One of the most expensive trading cards ever sold. Um, that's uh, that's nuts. To Post Malone. To Post the, Malone. The rock star guy with. You know, tattoos tattoos everywhere uh apparently is a giant nerd <laughs> worth with enough well, money you know, to buy a 2.6 million dollar trading card that's my favorite part of the story is like stars they're just like us <laughs> <laughs> except i would never pay two points i don't give a fuck if they were like we'll give you all the batman footage cut out of batgirl out of uh fucking aquaman whatever the fuck michael keaton only um, <laughs> I don't know that I'd cough up two point six million dollars for anything shy of something one could live in. Yeah, uh, let's hit the sadness. Sadness. Um, Paul Rubens, who disappeared behind a tie great suit and a bright red bow tie to create and star as the awkward manchild Pee Wee Herman, uh, has passed away at seventy years old. Um. On uh, the statement that, that was released uh, on Monday when he passed on his official Facebook page, it said, last night we said farewell to Paul Rubens, an iconic American actor, comedian, writer, and producer, whose beloved character P.B. Herman delighted generations of children and adults with his positivity, whimsy, and belief in the importance of kindness. Paul bravely and privately fought cancer for years. With his trademark tenacity and wit, a gifted and prolific talent, he will forever live in the com comedy pantheon and in our hearts as a treasured friend and a man of remarkable character. And generosity of spirit he uh i put up a tweet about this the other day because uh discussing film is where i read it said paul rubens wrote a message before he passed away last night and this is the message paul had written um please accept my apology for not going public with what i've been facing the last six years i have always felt a huge amount of love and respect from my friends, fan and fans, and supporters, I have loved you all so much and enjoyed making art for you. It's fucking beautiful, man. Like, this is a man who was fucking dying. I tweeted that, like, I know me. Like, if I was going through a thing, if I had a fucking hangnail, you wouldn't not hear about it. You would, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be me if I wasn't online fucking telling you every fucking single detail about the pain and the agony and, and trying to fucking claim as much attention and relevancy as I could from my fucking disease. 
This guy told nobody. Yeah. Kept it quiet, fought his fight by himself, and then fucking apologized before he died for not sharing that kind of information. This is the tweet that I put up with it just because I don't think I'll be able to sell it, say it quite as eloquently. I said, I know me. I'd be posting about my struggles on the daily, milking it until my last breath, desperate for attention and rel relevancy, but not Paul Rubens. If I'm not at least trying to be a person this classy and considerate in life, then maybe it's time I start. Thanks, Pee Wee. Hmm. I mean, for the gift of comedy and laughs and love that this dude gave us for decades. I, I taped the Pee Wee Herman show off HBO on a Betamax fucking tape <laughs> when I was a pre, when I was in uh, before my 20s, when I was a fucking teenager, before they even made Pee Wee's Big Adventure, when Phil Hartman was John B. the Genie, Mecca Lucka High, Mecca Honey, Chani Ho. This guy's been doing it for fucking decades. This guy was in the Blues Brothers. Mm -hmm. Paul yeah. Rubin's been around for a long fucking time. And Pee Wee, of course, like his best known creation and, and given joy and fucking love and laughter. And like fucking that quote destroyed me when I read that. Thank you. Listen, let's read that again, man. That's the last words of one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. Please accept my apology for not going public with what I've been facing the last six years. I have always felt a huge amount of love and respect from my friends, fans, and supporters. I have loved you all so much and enjoyed making art for you. That motherfucker was an artist and went out like an artist, just happy that he got to make some art for us. He made me laugh. Uh, he made me think. He made me feel things, made me happy to be alive. He gave me currency at one point when I was a kid and taped that show off of HBO. I passed it around to fucking friends who made, made me look good. People were like, how'd you find this? I'm like, well, it was on HBO. I didn't exactly discover fucking people. <laughs> but um, we lost somebody great, man. 70 years old, far too fucking young. Yeah. Remember him in Mystery Men as well? That's right. Spleen. I mean, hell, he's in a bunch of, he's in a couple of Cheech and Chong movies. That's how far he goes back. You're yeah. right. I saw a trailer recently. Nice a trailer for uh, Nice Dreams, and he was in the fucking trailer, I think. Um, but, you know, fucking, I'm a loner, Dottie, a rebel. Come mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, he was, he, he was not a perfect person. I don't think anybody is. I mean, he had his. He had his foibles and his weaknesses and his, you know, dalliances with the law, but all of which he owned up to, all of which he, you know, served whatever penance he needed to serve for, um, but just seems to very much love being Pee Wee Herman and would be Pee Wee Herman until the end and just loved performing and loved, to your point, making people laugh, you know, taking all that inspiration from like Howdy Doody and Captain Kangaroo and Rocky and Bullwinkle and channeling it into this character he invented the groundlings in the late seventies and tries to get on SNL with it. And they don't buy that. They decided they don't want PB Herman on SNL. Um, and then took it to Pee-wee's Pee -Wee's playhouse. And like, yeah, freaking Lawrence Fishburne is in PB's playhouse, you know, like Esapatha Murkison is in PB's playhouse. Phil Lamar, friend of the show is on PB's playhouse. I mean, it was this amazing, they, I think they won 22 Emmys for that. And that was the that was the show that he did for CBS, mm. Pee Wee's Playhouse. The thing that I taped off HBO was just a version of his live show that he did on stage for years, uh, the Pee Wee Herman show. Um, that was before the movie, before the fucking Emmys on the on the CBS Kids Morning Show. It's it sucks that anybody has to die, but like when fucking people who brought so much to the, happiness to the world um go it's particular blow and those final words man fuck that's yeah. some powerful shit and he, and he will always be a nerd for lots of reasons but hey man he was penguin's dad in batman returns right man he fucking threw penguin out he tossed him into the sewer in a wordless performance he was also movie. great in uh what was that movie the johnny depp movie about blow oh yeah like, this is a guy who could do a bunch of different things, man. But, like, 
thank God he had the presence of mind to be like, I'm going to put on this suit and little, this little bow tie and pretend to be a fucking kid. We got so much out of that. Change the culture, man. Change the culture. Put a dent in the universe. Mm. Jeff's kiss, Pee Wee Herman. Jeff's kiss, Paul Rubens, the mm. man behind Pee Wee Herman. It's a shame. Fucking, we all got to go, but like some cats you hope can hold on forever and stuff. Yeah. Reminds me a little bit of, of Chadwick Boseman, who had been suffering from cancer for a long time, working through it, you know, that he while making, you know, Civil War, while making Infinity War, like he was sick. But, you know, kept on fucking strapping on the armor and going to work. We only get a short time, kids. That's it. Doesn't matter who you are. You know, death, even for kings, it comes. Even for Pee Wee, it came. So make sure you do some stuff in this life. Good stuff, positive stuff. As Mark said on last episode when we were at San Diego Comic Con, be good. And being good means fucking like doing good for people. Paul Rubens did a lot of good for people. Probably made the difference between life and death for some people. Mm -hmm. Look, I know fucking the shit I've made every once in a while, people are like, your shit saved my life. And that's my bullshit. That means that fucking Pee Wee Herman saved a lot of fucking lives. He brightened up their dark days and kept people hanging on. That's yeah. what art does, man. It's a beacon of light in the dark. So true. Um, yeah. Fuck. It's a bummer. Yeah. It's a bummer. Just fucking. We're on a journey, kids, and we only got journey only goes in one direction, sadly. But Man, we were lucky to have had him at all. Yeah. Never mind fucking lamenting the fact that he's not here anymore. Let's celebrate the fact he did it at all. Brightened up the world for the time that he was here. Shine while you're here, my friends. For the darkness claims us all. As Mark said earlier in the show, winter is coming. <laughs> Copyright trademark, Mark Bernard. <laughs> it's mine. Nobody else's. <laughs> I'm at 5%, so my shit is about to die, so we should probably wrap this up. We can wrap it up. No Q&A this day. No Q&A this day. So much news, so much catching up. But next time, there'll be a Q&A. Um, and I'm, I imagine the next time may be in New Jersey, yeah. unless we stream a show prior to that. I'm sure yeah. we'll, maybe we'll figure it out prior to that. Kids, did you have a good time? I know I did. If you did. <laughs> you got to thank JC, Banff Man himself, for getting us to you and fucking saved us. When shit fell apart. Does that mean there's two YouTube files on online? No, it didn't disconnect long enough to to cut it and start a new one. So we got lucky. Well, well done. Heroic effort, my friends. <laughs> uh, there ain't no show without the guy who's over there. Over there. God, I can never do this. Down there. Dun, 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 dun. Here's the story. <laughs> Mark Bernardin. Uh, there's your fat man beyond for this week, kids. Go out and see Barbie. Go out and see Oppenheimer. Go watch Pee Wee's Big Adventure or some Pee Wee's Playhouse in memory of Paul Rubens. Indeed. For Aquaman, though shit looks bleak. <laughs> no, for the fact that we're going to get a Lando series. Uh, oh, and perhaps Wonder Woman's not gone after all. There's Indeed. There. There's also a Comic-Con cruise coming, apparently. Did you see that news? I did. I did, man. They're doing a cruise for Comic-Con. I think we talked about it at Hollywood Babylon at Comic-Con this year. Uh, Comic-Con is doing an official cruise, but you know what? So are we. Hell yeah. Um, Want to come on Cruise Askew and hang out with me and fucking Mark and shit and fucking Jason Muse and Ralph Garman and Jeff Anderson, Brian O'Holland, Trevor Furman, a bunch of people from my movies and stuff. Go to jayandsilentbobcruisesq.com and join up. We're at 75% sold. This thing don't happen until February. So yeah. you and 3,000 other fucking fans of the nonsense I do at sea. <laughs> what could go wrong? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> could become like Lord of the fucking Flies. Could become like Gilligan's Island with 3,000 of us and shit. Think of all the coconut radios we'll be able to build. <laughs> Um, thank you as always for paying attention to us even for this brief window of time kids uh that's your fat man beyond for this week for fat man beyond i'm uh kevin smith and i'm mark bernard tune in next time same fat time same fat channel smodcast.com or 
YouTube.com slash Kevin Smith. Jeff's kiss. Mwah. Be good. Ooh. This is the cat. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the AKA Ask Kev Anything. Every saga has a 10 year anniversary, ladies and gentlemen, and this is what happens when Jay and Sal Bob get old. I'm Kevin Smith. Kissing you!